Hi, welcome back to Storytime with the Chosen and Crown book, Women of the Bible. Just want you to know, we have a whole lot more t-shirts, but I don't have them all in stock at my house, so we're going to be recycling some, and they would be my favorite. So today we are doing Marked for God. If you have asked Jesus into your heart and you have started living your life for him and following him, you are marked for God. And I made this shirt because not only did I want to inspire and encourage myself and remind myself that I'm marked by God so I don't have to fear the mark of the beast, but neither do you. So enjoy this. If you want it, you can go to our website. So let's get started on today's story. Today we're going to be in Luke 10 and John 11 and 12. So let's get started. Here we meet Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, the man who died and Jesus brought back to life. In case you didn't know that, those are his sisters. It seems Martha may be the older sister and apparent head of the household she shared with her brother Lazarus and the sister Mary. In this story, Jesus and his disciples stopped for a visit. As was customary in those times, the host was expected to feed the visitors who showed up at their door. It was an expectation that the women served while the men visited. Martha was honored to fulfill her role and focused on preparing everything for Jesus and the other guests. The details of preparation were important to Martha. She was likely stressed and anxious to get everything ready. Who can relate to that? She was probably the type of person who jumped into action, always doing what needed to be done without being asked. And without asking, for help. Raise your hand if you can relate to that. She saw a need and she handled it. She could likely be described as dependable and hardworking, going to bed already thinking about what she would have to get done the next day. Raise your hand if you can relate. Sound familiar, right? Scripture does not say she asked for help. It simply states that she got annoyed when she saw her sister Mary listening at Jesus' feet instead of attending to details to feed them. Jesus knew what Martha was thinking and used this as a teaching moment. Sidebar, Jesus and our Heavenly Father always know what we're thinking. They always know what we're saying. Nobody can hide from them. They know and they hear. So that's why we need to be careful what we say and do. So Jesus knew what Martha was thinking and used this as a teaching moment. Upon Jesus' arrival, Mary didn't focus on anything but being near Jesus and listening to what he had to say. It appears that the Holy Spirit was showing her that his time there was important and she needed to listen to all he had to say. Her heart was drawn to Jesus. Martha was clearly focused on the task at hand. When she reached her breaking point, she spoke to Jesus to correct the situation for her. I'll let Jesus tell this part of the story. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Wow, if that doesn't like, snap you out of it. I don't know what will. His gentle voice telling you what you need to focus on. So, was Jesus scolding Martha for focusing on task rather than him? Was feeding them more important to her than what he had to say? Did Martha love Jesus as much as Mary? 
Jesus was trying to show Martha that he would not always be there. If she had to choose between listening to him and doing her duties, she should choose him. That's a big thing in our relationship with Jesus today, ladies. If we have to choose between serving God at church or spending time with him, getting to know him, does that sound like your life today? Are you busy from daylight to dark, lying in bed at the end of the day with your mind on overdrive from the task still on your to-do list? Do you feel guilty that you haven't spent time studying Adonai's word because you are just too busy? Do you try to justify reading a five-minute devotional simply as a check-off-the-box exercise? Do you ever think, God knows I'm busy and that I would spend time with him if I could? Have you ever thought, I'll read a Christian novel. That will be my Jesus connection for now because the Bible is just too hard to read. Do you listen to a podcast or online message to check off your Jesus time to-do list? Do you ever say, when such and such happens, I'll start studying then? If you answered yes to any of these questions, it's important to understand Jesus is not upset with you. There's no condemnation in those who belong to Christ Jesus. In this story, he is simply trying to show us what is important, not our task, but time with him. Jesus shows us that serving him is important and has its place, but time with him is more important than serving him. He prefers obedience over sacrifice. Jesus wants a relationship with us, but that won't happen if we are too busy serving him. In this story, Jesus chose Martha and Mary for such a time as this to teach us many important lessons. So what Jesus is trying to teach us, and it's in Scripture, 1 Samuel 15, 22, that God says he prefers obedience over sacrifice. Here's a good example that will help explain that. Are you serving so much for God that you don't get time to spend alone with God? God is more interested in you getting to know him. The serving comes out of your relationship with him. If you are serving all the time, but you don't spend time with him, that's not going to get you into heaven. Scripture tells us that. I'll never forget there was a girl at church I knew years ago. She was on five different surf teams. And check this out. She got an award for it. And she was so thrilled to be recognized for all her hard work. I'm not saying anything about her relationship. I'm just making a point. If you're on five different serve teams at church and you're wearing yourself out to the point you don't have time to spend alone studying God's word alone with him and getting to know him on a personal level through his word from Genesis to Revelation, then the five serve teams you are on are just a waste of time. So to be clear, get to know Jesus. Spend time in his word every day. It's called daily bread, not whenever bread. And then, out of your relationship with him, he shows you what he wants you to do to serve for him and to spread his love to others. So make sure you have that in order. And with Martha, she didn't have it in order at that time, and that's what God was showing her. It wasn't that feeding them wasn't important. It wasn't that what she was doing wasn't important. It was that Mary realized in her spirit that she was listening to. She was listening to the Holy Spirit in her tell her, you need to spend time with Jesus and hear what he has to say because this is short term. Martha was too busy to hear the Spirit tell her that. So Jesus is trying to teach us it's okay to be like Martha. Just know when you need to be like Mary. Does that make sense? I hope so. So let's proceed. In another story, we again find Mary in a situation that further proves what is most important to Jesus. 
She does something that brings her condemnation from everyone except Jesus. She is still focused on what matters most, honoring Jesus. He shares this story with us to further his point on what is important to him. So listen up. Jesus tells us in John 12, 1 through 8, six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that Judas cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, Leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And a little sidebar here. When he says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is also a shadow type message that applies to the end times. There's going to be a day when you're not going to be able to pray to Jesus. There's going to be a day, if you're waiting, having fun now, and you're waiting till later to give your life to Jesus, all in, you may wait too late. There's going to be a day when he's not going to be available. He's going to call his people up, his church up, and then it's going to be too late. So he's saying, while there's still time, Focus on me because I'm not always going to be here. We see here that Martha served. There's no mention of Mary serving or Martha complaining about the lack of help. Mary is focused on Jesus again, seeming to be led by the Holy Spirit to honor him in a unique way. She was immediately criticized for wasting an expensive jar of perfume to wash Jesus' feet, according to her critics. It could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. To Mary, it wasn't about the money. Her highest priority was to honor and worship Jesus. She gave everything, and that's what we should be doing. She never missed an opportunity to honor him in some way. Even when her brother was briefly dead, Mary honored him. So let's pop over to the story of Lazarus' sickness and death in John 11. Martha loved Jesus, but she was upset with him. She knew he could have prevented Lazarus from dying if he had come sooner. Martha knew Jesus performed miracles, but Jesus shows us that she wanted him to work the miracle in the way that she wanted it to happen. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. <laughs> She knew Jesus could heal Lazarus and expected him to do just that. It never occurred to her that he might have a better plan to show Adonai's glory. He performed an even more magnificent miracle by bringing him back from the dead than healing his sickness. That's what I'm talking about. If God takes away something that you think you want, or a person in your life that you thought was the one for you, if God takes those people away from you, he's got a better plan, always. He has a better plan for you. Let the toxic people go. Let the toxic jobs go. God's got a bigger plan. So here, Martha thought healing him from being sick would be a great miracle, and she wanted him to do it that way. And how many times have we told God, how to perform a miracle. Like somebody said one time that they told God exactly how to sell their house and who, what kind of people they wanted to buy it. 
and then weeks, months go by, and and the person said, I finally just said, God, just whatever you want to do. <laughs> and he did. But it was so funny that we often try to tell God how to do his job. He's got a better idea that we hadn't even thought of. It never occurred to her that he would bring her brother back from the dead and how amazing that would be and how God would use it. This is a great example of how he doesn't need us to tell him how to answer our prayers. He has a better plan we can't see. Simply believe and let him do. Jesus had even stated in John eleven four that Lazarus' sickness would not end in death. So God will get the glory. He purposely waited two additional days before traveling to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus to ensure this miracle would play out the way he had planned. He tells his disciples that he is only asleep, not dead. He then goes on to encourage Martha by telling her, and I'll let him tell it. This is verses 11, 25 through 27. Jesus tells her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. During the same story, Martha went to retrieve Mary because Jesus wanted to see her. She was not at Lazarus' tomb when he arrived. Mary had stayed behind with the guests who were mourning with her in their home. When Mary saw Jesus, she ran to him and fell at his feet, crying because she was in pain and seeking his comfort. It was then that Jesus wept with her and shared in her pain. He comforts us and cries with us. Martha believed in Jesus, but still had doubts, unintentionally putting limits on what she believed he could do. Again, he told her to trust him. He prayed and called Lazarus out of the tomb. When you read about these very different sisters, which sister do you most relate to? Are you Martha? Or are you Mary? Most likely, you resonate with one of them while reading this story. If you relate to Martha, consider pausing here, stepping back from your to-do list, and resting in his arms. It's not too late to realign your priorities and be more like Mary. The lesson here is not about becoming someone else, but about learning to put Adonai first, believing and trusting he knows best. He created Martha with her skill set, but was trying to teach her still to put him first. Psalms 46.10 Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Our Heavenly Father does have things he needs us to do, but the first thing he expects us to do and commands that we do in his word is to put him first. Put him before everything and everyone. Our eternity is dependent on this order. It says in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. When we align our priorities with his, he washes us in his shalom peace.
One of the things I wanted to share with you that jumped out at me in reading the different stories about Mary and Martha is when Lazarus died, Martha came running to him mad and accusing him for not healing her brother and doing what she thought Jesus should do and knew that he was capable of. And then Mary, that was the last thing on her mind. What she needed from Jesus was comfort. She runs to him and falls at his feet. He comforts her and weeps with her. Two very different approaches to their dead brother and what they went to Jesus with. Martha went to correct Jesus and tell him he was late. How often have we done that and said, Lord, why, 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 why? Why didn't you do this? Why did you let this happen? Why didn't you answer my prayer? Why, why are they gone? How many times have we done that? That was the Martha response. We need to be thinking in the Mary response. And everybody can think like this. We don't have to become another person. He, Jesus is trying to teach us in all of this to be more like Mary. He's not saying we need to be cookie cutter, all the same people. He's trying to help us get our priorities in straight and to trust and believe him and go to him for comfort, knowing that he can comfort us and he knows what's best. And even if Lazarus died or didn't come back or didn't get well or was gone forever, for Mary, she wasn't focused on why Jesus did or didn't do what he could have done. She was focused on her pain and that Jesus could, could comfort her. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us is to focus on Jesus, not our pain, not our problems, not our plan, but on him. It changes the trajectory and that's when he washes you with his shalom peace. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. So really shalom peace is peace, peace. <laughs> Learn something else new today. So he washes you with that shalom peace, extra, extra good peace that you can't get from anywhere else when you put him first and just let him control the narrative. So that jumped out at me. What jumped out at you? We can discuss the reflection questions, but we haven't prayed yet. So what did this story, what did you learn in this story? And you might not have enough paper to write that down on. But so many things to learn from this story and how it applies to our lives. We need to figure out if we're Mary or Martha and pray about what Jesus needs to teach us from it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing me how much you love me. Thank you for showing me in this story which sister I am. Thank you for helping me realign my priorities to meet yours. Thank you for showing me what's important and the only thing that has an eternal impact. Thank you for showing me that time with you will bring me shalom peace. Thank you for your repentance and forgiveness Thank you for not giving up on me. I promise to put you first and make you my primary focus. Everything else comes after my time with you. Amen. I hope this helped you guys and encouraged you. Until next time, God bless you.